Hi, everyone. So we have 30 minutes to talk about solving the people problem, which really is, is the, the underlying factor of everything that we do and everything that we count in the economy. Of course, the global labor market is undergoing some of the most profound and rapid shifts in modern history. Uh, the president also touched on that. AI is transforming the nature of work across industries, demographics, and immigration policies are creating both shortages and surpluses of workers. And then we have the de-risking of supply chains, which frankly could change everything. So thank you and welcome to my wonderful panel. Madam President, let me start with you because you touched on that. You have a very young population. What is your biggest challenge in trying to, to stay away from the brain drain? So educating people, but then keeping them in the country. Um, that's an extremely important question, not only for my country, but I would say uh, for, for the wider region of Southeast Europe. Um, of course, the human capital is the most precious resource that we have, with 53% of our people under 25, two-thirds under 35. But if we don't take the right decisions, the smartest decisions long term, if the long term vision does not fit uh, the purposes that we have, <coughs> then of course this precious asset can become a burden. So we need to undertake the right decision when it comes to economic policy such that truly support human capital. And I would say in, in, uh, this has to go in, in three main directions. Uh, for, and of course we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but we learn from countries around the world that have faced similar problems. The first is investing in education. It's so important that, especially for a country where the youth uh, is the majority of the population, there is quality education. And I'm not only talking about traditional kind of education, obviously about skill education as well, uh, that can very much link what universities produce with what the labor market needs, what businesses truly needs. Uh, and secondly, invest in the kind of health system quality health uh, that is offered to every citizen, because we see in our country, as well as in the rest of the region, people leave, even those with middle income, not only those that have lower wages, because they don't have the right health uh, standards, they don't have the, the, the right support that they need in the health institutions. And thirdly, we need to have the kind of economic policies that really produce good paying jobs. But let me put an additional element here. Young people need hope. They need hope. They need to trust their institutions. They need to believe that the good decisions from which they will benefit and prosper are coming up. So trust in the institutions is so important to instill that kind of optimism that they need to stay in the country, to instill that kind of belief that they need to understand that if they work hard, they will get there and they can realize their dreams, their careers, and what they need, of course, not just for themselves, but for their families as well as for the society. Thank you so much. And John Sadinsky, you're an advisor to many chief executives around the world, and you really look at human capital and the people's problem from exactly the point of view of the president, that actually sometimes we overcomplicate things, but, but this is, demographics is basically, you know, the basis of every decision. Francine, we we look at the global demographics, I think we have to separate the, the G7 or the G20 from what we now call the global south, which is um, the demographics are such that um, the populations and particularly labor force participation in the developed world is declining, it's declining rapidly. Um, the global south has got a very robust young population that uh, is, is ready to be engaged. And I think we have to reassess labor. And I, I, you, you and I have talked about this. Labor is always given a back seat in the discussion. It's always treated, I think, as an independent variable. But the reality is it's a dependent variable in terms of economic growth. It's a dependent variable in terms of political stability. It's a dependent variable in terms of... In, you look at things like wage inflation, managing inflation. So I think we've got to put labor now and people and human capital, as the president has said, at the center of our global strategic discussion. Um, it, it's very interesting because when we look at economies, everyone wants to look at Japan and say, well, Japan has survived, continues to be a robust economy with a declining demographic. Um, we now have artificial intelligence, we now have robotics, and I think we re need to rethink 
how labor relates across borders uh, to keep people in place, but also give them uh, a better experience in the workforce. Johnny Roddy, you, you have 250,000 employees. I mean, it, this is a challenge, right? When you look at demographics, how, how and your company is a conglomerate, so you have also different industries. How do you view you know, different demographics within those groups and, and their needs? Uh, well, first of all, Francine, thank you for, for having me. I'm honored. Uh, this is a very important topic, the topic of demographic, and I was greatly moved by President uh, Viosa's uh, remarks uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the story of Kosovo. The Indonesian story is equally um, inspiring. Uh, Indonesia is a country of 280 million people, but only 25 years ago, if you read the New York Times, Bloomberg, The Economist, the words Indonesia and Balkanization would appear side by side. Mm. Nobody believed that a country so large, so geographical spread, so diverse, could uh, survive um, and could have an identity that was strong enough to unify that country. But here we are 25 years, years later. It's a strong country. It's a fledgling democracy. Uh, not as young as Kosovo. Uh, in Kosovo, 70% of the people is under 35. In Indonesia, it's 50% is under, under, under 35 years old. Um, but it's a, it's a vibrant country. But you're right. I think on the issue of uh, demographics, there's really two things that I think um, occupy the, 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 the discourse. One is about how do we as a country grow rich before we grow old. And so for a country like Indonesia with a per capita income of 4,500 today, this is our last opportunity. The, la the next 20 years is the last opportunity for us to be able to move up the value chain, to be able to achieve uh, a high value added economy. And I believe the Indonesian example is, is, is reflective of many other countries in Asia. But equally important is not only how do we become rich before we grow old, but on a, on a point that John mentioned earlier, even a country like Indonesia will age faster than we think. The global replacement rate in 1990 was at 3.3%. Today, it's at 2.3%, just marginally above the replacement rate of 2.1 times at which the global population remains stable. And so even for a country like Indonesia, for a region like ASEAN uh, that is relatively young today, very soon we'll, be, we'll have to face the same problems as all the other, uh, many other countries around the world are, are facing. Today, more than two-thirds of the world's population is living in a country with either stable or shrinking populations. And so what this means for politics, what this means for retirement, what this means for the economy and growth and productivity, a lot of things to think about. Um, but ultimately, I'm optimistic. I do believe that the advances that we're making today in the world with technology and artificial intelligence will provide an avenue for the world to be able to increase productivity in a way that completely transforms the way that economies work and the global uh, economy will interact. And John Sudinsky, it's difficult actually to pinpoint one single policy that will make a difference in demographics. <clears throat> but if you look <clears throat> at a number of policies that actually make it better to, you know, people to have more children and therefore making it easier to also expand some of the labor of work. Is there a mix? Is there a country that gets it right? You're all, it's always, whenever you call out a country you inevitably find yourself on social media for the next 48 hours <laughs> on something. Um, one of the things that uh, this whole debate about declining demographics in the developed world or in the G7 or G20, um, when you actually go around and talk to people, you discover the average cost of raising children uh, has gone up extraordinarily. As a matter of fact, in the developed world, it's now for the average middle-class family, uh, a child can constitute as much as 20 to 25% of their after-tax income per year to raise. Um, so you're asking which country is the model? Countries that provide uh, an infrastructure to allow the family. Um, you have lots of examples in the Nordic region where there is the ability for women to have an active role in the uh, workplace, but there's also a support system there that provides them in terms of education and uh, childcare, and 
also the educational system is not extraordinarily expensive. Um, I, I think, though, that we also have to take this forward um, because that model's been going for 50 years. Figure out where can we, how can we change the model faster in the developed world. Um, and I know you're going to get onto the subject of artificial intelligence and robotics because that that will play a big role at trying to. Um, this is not just about human capital, but it's also about bringing talent into the economy yeah. and how you nurture that. Yeah, and there's still a question mark on whether AI is a force for good or a, a force to, to worry about. But, I'm President, what are some of the policies that, that you're looking at that could? that can make a difference in demographics? Uh, what we've seen in, in um, our part of the world is that, I, I would absolutely agree, except that not just the support system for mothers, but also for the fathers, as there yes. needs to be a proper sharing of, of duties within the family as everywhere yeah. else. Uh, so what we've been <laughs> doing is, of course, introducing uh, support from the families in a couple of directions. First of all, is investing in early childhood education. And I can't, I can't stress this enough, what a transformative power it has for the entire society. Because when you don't have enough kindergartens, a mother and a father don't know where to send their kids. Therefore, normally, it's the mother that stays at home. And that increases the inactivity mm. rate among women, thereby hurting the economies of the country. This is what has happened in Kosovo. We found out that when we invest in early childhood education, uh, there are enough places in, in the public system mainly where uh, families can afford to send their kids, therefore then the mother gets a job, therefore in many cases when you are economically empowered as a woman, it means that you will not tolerate domestic violence, and that brings to a more equitable society, but also in it increases the economic growth of the country, because you're using also the other 50% of the workforce, because of course it's not just the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do to make sure that you include both uh, halves of your population in your workforce and in the contribution to economic growth. So ultimately, investing in early, early childhood education transforms the society into a more equal, and equal one, but also the economy into a bigger and more sustainable one. And secondly, I would say family-friendly policies in both when it comes uh, parental leave. So in Kosovo, uh, there is a possibility for a leave of up to one year after you have a child. And with the new changes in legislation, the mom and the dad can choose who takes what. So it's not like an imperative that only the mom takes uh, time away from work, but you can decide within the family what is more uh, adaptable to that certain family in many aspects, from the emotional ones to the economic ones. And finally, I would say, um, of course, the family size and uh, these kind of demographics really play an extremely impo important role on the topic that we just mentioned, the human capital, because in Kosovo, we are part of the aging continent. Like everywhere else that we go in Europe, uh, of course, they need this workforce. So there are so many countries around us that are trying to take away our workforce. So it's very important that while we support families, at the same time, when these children grow as adults, they have the proper economic uh, opportunities to prosper within their countries and not just to look at ways how they can get away from there. And then no matter the fact that you have a young population, when they get away, you end up with a demographic, demographic problem. Thank you, Madam President. I forgot to mention, you can also ask questions that will not be visible to anyone apart from me through your QR code. So please, we're looking forward to many of your questions. John, when you look at immigration, right? And so we have demographics, we want to talk about immigration, then we'll talk about AI. Sure. How difficult is it, again, to have the right policy mix? Because there's a real difference between not only the global south, but almost really country by country. Yeah. Uh, I think immigration is one of the solutions or pieces of the puzzle that need to take place as the world deals with an aging global population. But also, unfortunately, I think we're living in a world where uh, borders are becoming more and more disintegrated. So this, I think, will become more and more of a challenge. But I do believe, uh, as uh, President Viosa has mentioned, that I think part of the solution to the global aging population is the ability of different countries to complement each other. Indonesia, for example, one of the largest producers or, or, or trainers of, of nurses. 
uh, which is a big need in many developed markets, especially in markets that are much older in population like Japan uh, and countries in Europe like the Netherlands. Um, so today, uh, in, our, in, our, in a nursing school that we operate, we, we, are, we, we produce about 600 nurses every year. About 20% of them now are trained to be able to go abroad um, to, the, to the Netherlands, uh, soon to Singapore. So things like this, but it's difficult. One, for immigration policy issues. Second, for language issues. Uh, but I do believe that this is something that we need to deliberately try to solve to be able to uh, help us uh, arrive there at a, uh, in, in a more efficient state. And John Sadinsky, a lot of the times it makes sense economically, but politicians are going the other way. Whew. This is a real tough issue right now, um, in the, certainly in the, in the developed world, um, Francine. And it's one where you've got corporations and industries that would like to embrace gaps and what I call have strategic immigration, looking for certain types of talent uh, to introduce into the economy to fuel growth, diversity. On the other hand, you have governments that are very sensitive for political reasons, for reasons we now have of populism or nationalism. So you have a very tough uh, political environment. Um, everybody is very familiar in this room with um, how, how brave um, uh, Chancellor Merkel was when she introduced um, over a million and a half Syrians uh, into the German economy. Uh, and I think if you look at that, uh, the, uh, the actual track record of that integration, the way that the German economy handled it was very systematic. People had to learn German, they had to uh, develop a set of skills, they had to apply for jobs, they have to be registered. Um, and that was done in a very efficient, tactical way. And now, you would say many years later, they were integrated into this society. There's probably about 10% of the group that is still either left or hasn't integrated. Many people said that was humanitarian. But when you actually got her perspective, it was necessary to keep as an engine for the German economy. So I think you have to look at what I call tactical or strategic immigration. But I also think AI might be a very elegant bridge to this and allow people to remain in their own country and work in Kosovo, but also work for Alphabet Google or Amazon, but remain and be a productive member of, of, of a local economy, but part of a global group. Madam President. Um, I definitely agree. And just to take one example of Kosovo's diaspora, we have a very large diaspora, mostly uh, that have left uh, during the genocidal war of Milosevic, uh, and uh, mostly living in countries like Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, the United Kingdom, the United States, and so on. Um, and probably if we look at statistics around the world, it's the most integrated diaspora. Mm. It's because there were proper systems in place mm. to train them, to equip them with the skills that they needed based on the labor market that existed in these certain countries. Uh, but they were also ready to make sure that they contribute. Uh, they learn from the values-based systems mm. uh, where they are living. And now they are some of the biggest contributors to Kosovo. Uh, not only through remittances, which is really helping our economy, but through joint investments uh, in our country, in property, in many businesses that are extremely successful, and at the same time bringing back the kind of knowledge and expertise that we truly needed from these very developed countries. So it, it's a great example that I, I, I mean, from a country like a small as Kosovo, yeah. but I think that has an important story to tell. It's one of those cases where you can see how my Migration, which was, of course, done because of genocidal policies against our people, so under very difficult circumstances, but it still happened, mm -hmm. and, but it has worked. So these are very, very integrated people within the societies that they live. And yet, Madam President, it seems that even if there's case studies, the borders are going up in Europe much more than they should because of fear, because of politicians. Do you expect it to get worse, so immigration to go down? 
Um, it looks like it's getting worse. It looks like it's getting worse. I mean, just listening to some of the speeches among many politicians around the world, um, you think, um, you know, how, worse, how much worse can it get? But unfortunately, that's the direction that we're going into. So we need to understand that, as it was stated earlier, that this, is also, uh, this also needs to be taken as an opportunity rather than just a burden. As long as a country sets forward the right policies, the right trainings, the right integration uh, policies, I think it can help. Obviously, not always. There needs to be rule of law procedures in place, of course, if there are people that have been or will get involved in crime, like in every society, in every country in the world. Uh, but I mean, just starting off with judging people just based on the country where they come from, based on uh, the color of their skin, based on their background, based on ethnicity, that is for racism, which I absolutely do not support. And I think people should be given an opportunity. Look, I've been a refugee myself. No one leaves their home because they want to, only because they have to. No one wants to become a refugee but each and every one of us can become one. We have to keep that in mind. So if someone leaves, make sure that in your country you have the proper rules in place that can make them want to integrate, want to contribute to your society, to your country, and to your economy. It is going to be a very big challenge, but I think we have to learn from businesses. I mean, look at the companies around you. These are people who survived three huge crises in just two years. The pandemic, the global economic crisis, the global energy crisis, their resilience, their inclusion policies should be a testament to what politicians should do. And by the way, this is why I'm here, to learn from all of you and how we can succeed as politicians the same way that you have succeeded as businesses. So as much as we can learn from the good practices, the more we can make sure that the right policies are in place. Thank you. John Riada, when you look at... When you look at AI, so millions of jobs could be lost because of AI. Whose job is it to retrain the workforce? Is it government or, or business? I, I think it's everyone's job. I think it's government's job for sure. I think it's business's jobs to retrain its workforce. I also think it's the jobs of schools uh, to make sure that we have an education system and a curriculum that trains its graduates for a lifelong learning. Um, and so I do believe that AI and all the other advances in technology holds the key to the solutions of an aging world. Uh, but I also say that to say that I don't see the aging world as a problem. I think it's something that not only is inevitable, um, but in the same way as in the last 50 years, the problem was having too many people in this world. Today, we just have a different kind of problem to solve. And in certain other industries, we've faced that problem. For example, in agriculture, over the last 40 years, the world have, has had fewer and fewer people in agriculture. And yet that hasn't stopped us from feeding a growing population because productivity has gone up thanks to technology. So I think in the same way, using technology and by increasing productivity, it's okay to have a smaller or relatively smaller workforce to be able to support a larger retiring population. And so AI, I think, is one part of a technological solution that can solve that. And it is the responsibility of all the different stakeholders uh, in the world to be able to make progress towards that. But John Sadinsky, we don't really know where AI ends up, right? So you, you think that it could be a force for good for workers, for example, to retrain, maybe with languages? Yeah, first of all, it's early days on AI. Um, and if you look at... Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's changing the world at an exponential rate. We all know that. Um, but if you look at this important linkage between the developed world, and, and I use the word term global south, um, AI is already, there are a number of large uh, technology companies and bigger corporations that through AI are working in, say, 50 countries around the world, and many of whom are in the global south. Um, and AI is playing a constructive role in terms of teaching language, uh, educating children, training people. 
I think AI is also raising this broader question that young people outside of the developed world through AI can get a different type of education. They're not getting the traditional education that we're used to, and it's really going to force us to revisit the educational models, something that the president alluded to, but it's going to allow people to develop skill sets that will allow them to remain in their country and through AI be linked up with some of the larger technology companies either in America, Europe, or in China, or in the rest of the world. So I, I think as long as we remember humanity and AI have to be linked together from now on as a, as a policy and not treat it as two things fighting with each other. Because at the end of the day, human beings thrive on human interaction. And we have to remember that. That's at the core of the dignity of work, I think. And we have to remember, we're talking about work today, we're talking about labor. And we can't ignore that when we're talking about AI. Madam President, how do you look at the challenges of AI? There's always a timeline problem, that actually training a human could take a much longer time span than AI will catch up with the jobs of tomorrow. Uh, it does, but I think as long as we keep in mind what was just stated, that there needs to be an interaction and complementarity of both the human element as well as what AI is, is offering to humanity in general, uh, we, can't, we have to make that balance. There are cases, of course, where the training will take a little bit more time, but we cannot entirely get rid of the human interaction is what inspires people to engage. It's what inspires them to succeed. It's what inspires them to work with others. So if we entirely take the human element from uh, business interactions, from people-to-people -people connections, from B2B connections, uh, I think we will entirely fail. So, and, and let me perhaps get back to the gender equality element here, what we've seen from some of the studies so far is that if the human element is taken away and we just look at the AI and rapidly move on with technology, uh, of course it will mostly affect women. So we need from now on, and we're already too late if I might add, make sure that we start the proper trainings that women will need in order to cope with the uh, fast evolving mar needs of the markets and to make sure that AI does not create even more gender disparity than the ones that our societies and, and uh, you know, planet Earth generally is facing, no matter how emancipated a society. Uh, there is no country on Earth that has entirely managed to overcome the challenges of uh, lack of, of gender equality. So for that reason, uh, we need to take these uh, into account and it's, there is an urgent need that these trainings start now if, have not, if they have not started yet in order to make sure that we're not too far behind and we only move on with AI, leaving the humanity element aside. And that also, there's a danger that there's a dispersion between the haves and the haves nots, right? So John, sh should we look at universal basic income? Is that something that we should talk more seriously about? In, in many, especially developing countries, uh, the issue of technological innovation and the disruption that it causes is a serious issue, especially for countries like Indonesia and other emerging markets that are starting at a fairly low level of value added as economy. And so in some ways, we would not have the same opportunity as other countries that have industrialized over the last 20, 30 years to at least gradually move up that chain. For a country like Indonesia, we're moving from agriculture to basic manufacturing, and now the world has moved to you know, fairly, you know, very deep technology like AI and big data and all these other, other issues. So it, it, is a, it is a delicate transition to make. And I think the governments need to be very mindful of making sure that as the country grows and the country transitions, that this growth is inclusive. As to whether we'll go so far as to introduce universal basic income, I think the debate is still open, and I think that's a. I, I think for markets like Indonesia, I think that's going too far. I think the government has done a good job in introducing other forms of social benefits, uh, such as uh, uh, universal healthcare coverage, social security, basic access to education, and things like that. That I think is a much more tailored approach and a more effective approach uh, to be able to encourage innovation, productivity. Uh, without some of the controversial pitfalls of UBI. 
And, and John, do you expect, John Studinsky, do you also expect, I guess, labor rights in, in an age of AI to increase? I had a couple of questions about the UAE, UAW strikes, actually, and the pressure that they put on automakers in the US. In terms of? In just labor rights, so if not uh, unions, but laborers coming together to try and put pressure to have a better salary and, and to have, um, you know, just better rights in general. It's such a general question. I mean, it's, gonna, you're, it's really going to come down to the country and the industry. Um, but I think that you're going to be able to compare things much more uh, rigorously on an international level, certainly. And that's one of the things that, that, that AI... I'm not so sure that's related to AI as much as it's going to be related to um, getting back to the labor force itself and, and what you're trying to do with human capital. Madam President, just final thoughts from you. What are you, I mean, you were optimistic also about the youth in your country. Uh, certainly, it's, uh, it's even necessary to be optimistic, especially in the face of so many challenges, but it's, it's, um, uh, it's in our blood to be very optimistic. I mean, it's a nation that has gone through so many hurdles throughout centuries, and we've shown so much resilience, and uh, we went from occupation to occup occupation to a genocidal war. We rose from the ashes. And we're still very resilient. And even in terms of economy, we've shown right after the pandemic with the highest economic growth, uh, which was an unprecedented uh, double-digit growth uh, in our society, in our, in our economy, of course, thanks to the resilience of businesses uh, who are uh, also helping the country. It's, it's always, you know, both sides. The government needs to support the businesses, but it's also the other, uh, the other way around. So uh, I think there is absolutely room for optimism. We just need to make sure that there are basic principles, including ethics principles, including the principle of humanity, that we never lose sight of when building economic policies, and always uh, uh, keeping in mind that, uh, especially when you have such great resources like youth, that you don't lose sight of that fact. That is your greatest resource. Make sure that you do everything and you go above and beyond in investing in them because that's the only way to overcoming any economic challenge that will come your way. And I think that's the same for small or big countries. Uh, and for that reason, uh, some of these basic principles apply uh, equally so no matter the sheer size of the countries we represent. Well, thank you so much to my wonderful panel looking at the people's problem. Thank you. Thank you.